exercise. As you can hear, <clears throat> something is stuck in my throat. Let's take our Bibles and turn to number, or excuse me, to Acts chapter 9. Tonight, the Lord willing, we are looking at Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. And the question is, are you a Tabitha? Are you a Tabitha? Very interesting to compare this little segment with the segment at which we looked last week. Last week, we looked at Aeneas, the man who was sick of the palsy. We saw how God used Peter in a very special way there in that passage. Peter just happened to be passing through and came to the saints at Lydda. And there was a man there by the name of Aeneas, a man who had been passed over and passed by for many years. He'd missed all the action. He had been sick with the palsy, that is, he had been paralyzed for eight years, which meant he missed the ministry of John the Baptist, he missed the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he missed the healing miracles that were taking place in the early part of the book of Acts. He was flat on his back in one spot in an out-of-the-way house someplace, but God had special plans for him. How exciting that is to know that no matter how insignificant we are, how poor we are, how helpless physically we are, how incapacitated, God has special plans for us. And many times he uses very special people in our lives and then through that he takes us and uses us for an extensive testimony. <clears throat> We saw that because of Aeneas, the entire region, a very large region around Sharon, came to Christ. 
He became active in his witness, though he had been paralyzed for eight years. When God healed him, when God raised him back up again, and we're going to see another raising up tonight with Tabitha, but when God raised up Aeneas, Aeneas then carried the gospel of Christ. He knew that his life was eight years shorter than it would otherwise have been in terms of his witness. And so he determined to make every minute count. Dear people, how old are you? Think about your own age right at this moment. How much time do you have left before God calls you home? He might call some of us home tonight. How are you going to use the few minutes that you have left for eternity? In the silence, you can hear the clock ticking. It ticks. It ticks. Your life is shorter at this moment than when you entered this auditorium. Aeneas was motivated by the fact that he had been unable to do anything, and now that he was able, he was going to use every moment for Christ. Have you made that commitment? Were all of your thoughts, words, and deeds will from this point forward glorify Christ? Do you have your own plans or are you seeking God's plans? Have you determined what you want to do or have you yielded to the Spirit of God and told him as our Lord did on the cross, not my will, but thine be done. Acts chapter 9, 32, picked up with Peter. We've just finished the ministry of Paul. We saw the contrast between the two of them, both involved in active ministry at the same time, but in different locations. Both gifted as apostles, and their parallel ministries show that they have spiritual equality. One man was the apostle to the Jews, that's Peter. The other man was the apostle to the Gentiles, that's Paul. The miracles that Peter did, as recounted by Acts, are also miracles that we discover Paul doing in the book of Acts. Peter is compared individually to Paul. The last time we see Peter and John together was at Philip's Samaritan Revival, but here we see them compared individually. John is no longer under Peter's shadow. It's interesting that God chose not to give us specific information about the ministry of John in the book of Acts. He just takes us with Peter and Paul, the apostles to the Gentiles and the apostle to the Jews. The rest of the apostles are still back in Jerusalem. It's not as though they are doing nothing. We see them in Acts chapter 15, gathered as the entire group of apostles with the elders at Jerusalem. We find the elders are functioning and participating. They have grown spiritually, men who had trusted Christ, men who had grown in their faith, men who had been trained and discipled and mentored by the apostles, and now sitting with the apostles in making decisions. It was not merely the apostles who made the decisions, and then nobody else got to do anything until finally the apostles all died. We find them sitting with the apostles at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. But we find God took Peter out of that group for a very temporary time and for two very specific purposes. We find him first going up to the Samaritan revival with John. And they authenticate what's taking place there. And then we find God taking him and using him in the lives of two individuals. Big revival down to two individuals. But with those two individuals, we find a huge expanse and spread of the gospel. First with Aeneas, there is a gigantic spread of the gospel. And we'll see tonight that as a result of the healing of Tabitha, raising her from the dead, there is again another huge expanse of the gospel. Both of these two locations, both Lydda and Joppa, 
Both of them were key in terms of the transportation routes and the communication routes in the ancient world. And as a result, in the first case, an entire region is reached for Christ. In the second case, that was a north and south movement. In the second case, we find an east and west movement. Joppa is a very key city, and we'll be talking about that in just a moment. God took Peter and used him to spread the gospel through these two very insignificant people to regions both north and south and east and west. Later, we're going to find the Apostle Paul is used also in very key locations to spread the gospel. Not merely at Jerusalem, which he does with power, and we have a great deal of information about that, but then God takes him all the way to Rome. And there in Rome, we see tremendous things happening. In between, Paul does missionary journeys throughout Asia and the Middle East. Tremendous spread of the gospel through key communication centers. It's important for us to recognize that. God has the use of many small places but it's interesting that at the beginning, God shows the key centers of commerce and communication from which to launch the gospel of Christ. When we think missions, we should think that way. Indeed, we must send missionaries to remote areas. But when we look at the New Testament, we see that one of the primary ways in which God worked was to send his missionaries to key centers from which the gospel could then be spread. Corinth was a center like that. Ephesus was a center like that. Rome was a center like that. And we find major epistles written to and from those various locations. The second thing we learned was that Peter's itinerant ministry was a ministry that God ordained. God got him to Samaria because of the revival. But then the path that God chose for him was not a path that either you or I probably would have taken. First it was to Lydda, which was a small town southeast of Joppa, about 10 miles. And then we go from there to our next location, which instead of being inland on a path going north and south, is actually on the seacoast. To Joppa. Some other things that we discover about this return here and the comparison with what we've seen with Philip and his intersections with an individual, the Ethiopian eunuch, was how different each intersection of life is. You have many intersections in life. God takes his other believers, others who are here, who gives them different intersections in life. The Ethiopian eunuch, a rich man, a powerful man, a man of Gentile birth, but of Jewish religion, a man who is neither male nor female, a man who is a eunuch, and sends Philip to him. Then he takes Peter, one of the high-powered apostles, <clears throat> and instead of sending him to a powerful person, sends him to a man who is paralyzed the infinite, intricate ways of God. The rich man, the Ethiopian eunuch, in charge of the entire treasury for the country of Ethiopia, we don't know his name. The poor man who's a cripple, we know his name. Isn't it interesting what God chooses to reveal to us in his word? Now we'll see the Ethiopian eunuch in heaven and we'll get to know what his name is. But God chose not to record it in scripture, which is forever settled in heaven. Think about that honor given to Aeneas, a nobody. Think about that honor given to Tabitha, a woman, and really a nobody. And how that honor has been withheld from some who are rich and powerful and, in their time, famous. There are many things about the ways of God that we do not 
understand. And yet God in his wisdom chooses to do it that way to let us know that he is the one who is in control. Now tonight we're in verses 36 through 43. <clears throat> now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. They had a dead body. It's the Middle East. It's hot. You cannot leave a dead body unburied for very long in the Middle East. Certainly not in that kind of climate. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise! And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. I suspect she was surprised. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. A fascinating portion of scripture especially placed in its context in juxtaposition with the passage about Aeneas. Nobody had called for Peter at Lydda to help Aeneas. But the disciples at Joppa called Peter to solve an even tougher problem than they had had at Lydda. Aeneas was paralyzed. Tabitha was dead. Where is Lydda located? It's, uh, excuse me, where is Joppa located? Lydda, of course, was inland, but Joppa was located on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was about 30 miles from Jerusalem as the crow flies. The name of the city means beautiful. You know that city today as Jaffa or Jaffa. It's a very ancient city. It is a very prime location on a port. It is a city that appears in the lists of the conqueror Tutmos III in the 15th century before Christ. That's 3,500 years ago. Its name is also found in the Telemarna letters, very important letters of communication in the 14th century on clay tablets. It was included in the land division given to the tribe of Dan in Joshua 1946. And it would be very interesting, we don't have time tonight, but to look at what's going on with the tribe of Dan when we get to the book of Revelation. This was also a key location for trade and commerce. Not merely north and south as we saw with Lydda, but now we're going to have commerce that is going to be able to go all the way across the Mediterranean Sea. We're also going to see that this is a key place in relation to Jerusalem, which is to the northwest of it. It is here at Joppa that Solomon, when he built the temple, received from Hiram of Tyre the trees of Lebanon. They were floated from Lebanon down the seacoast sea and arrived at the town of Joppa. According to Second Chronicles 2.16, later, after the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity, Zerubbabel, as commanded under the edict of Cyrus, had cedar trees brought from the mountains of Lebanon to Joppa. 
they would cut them down, drag them to the coast instead of trying to carry them overland, and they would float them down to the city of Joppa. Joppa also is very uh, important in the life of one other man that's an Old Testament prophet. You recall that Joppa is the seaport that where Jonah left as he was disobeying God on his way to Tarshish, Jonah 1.3. He went to Joppa to catch a boat to go west and flee from God. Joppa has intertestamental history as well. It was at Joppa during the Hasmonean Wars that one of the Maccabean sons, not Judas, but the son Jonathan, there were several sons of uh, Mattathias, the priest, and uh, during those Maccabean Wars, the intertestamental period, that is between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, Jonathan Maccabeus was there at the city of Joppa, 148 BC. He took the city and because he didn't entrust, didn't trust the people who lived there because they were such an international group of people, he decided to establish a garrison there. His brother Simon uh, later made it into a haven after the war against Antiochus Epiphanes. Fascinating history. This is a city where a great deal of activity has taken place throughout all of history. We find that the Romans destroyed that city twice. It changed hands several times during the Crusades. But the impact of Peter here in this passage was clearly felt for at least 400 years. The Christians became so numerous in Joppa that the early church in that time it was made the seat of a bishopric in the fourth century. They continued to grow, they continued to expand. It became a center of Christianity. Fascinating to think that this is the place that God called Peter to go from healing a poor paralytic to raising one woman from the dead. And it was known all over the ancient world as a result. God plays his pieces on the board, even his so-called pawns, in a masterful way. He is the one who has determined the game and he will win the game. God was clearly directing Peter at this point. As the disciples heard about Aeneas, they heard that Peter was there. Word had spread very fast from Lydda to Joppa. And when Tabitha dies, they immediately send for Peter. They didn't send for Peter before that. Isn't that interesting? They had to reach a crisis point before they went and called Peter to come. How many times do we have to reach crisis points in our lives before we call for the Lord's help? But Peter was a man who was clearly in the center of the will of God. God was clearly directing him through this call to the city of Joppa. He had his specific what we might call his specific missionary call. It reminds us of a very important principle established by David in the Psalms. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. If you are a man or a woman or a young person, who is in the center of God's will, you can count on God directing your steps. The direction that Peter is taking, he's heading back for Jerusalem. <laughs> but this is clearly not the direction that probably you or I would have chosen to go. Later we find God will clearly direct Paul by a specific missionary call. What we have termed these days the Macedonian call. And we sing it in our hymns. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. 
Peter got his Joppa call. Paul got his Macedonian call. We see that in Acts 16. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, did you know that sometimes God forbids the preaching of the word? In a specific location, no less. We'll talk about that more when we get to Acts chapter 16. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer? Very important when we get to the Thessalonian epistles and Paul begins to talk about the return of Christ. We find the Holy Spirit doing something here and not merely restraining evil, but restraining his servants from doing what they thought would be the will of God. More about that when we get to Acts 16 too. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Clearly we see, see God giving Peter a call here. Parallel, but a different kind. We have disciples coming and calling Peter. With Paul, it's a vision. We noted last week how God often uses men with identical gifts in different locations, in different ways, and through different means. One is not better than the other. One is not more supernatural than the other. It is God who is controlling and directing both of these situations. Tabitha didn't die two weeks before that when Peter was up in Samaria. Tabitha didn't die after Peter got to Jerusalem. Just like there was a precise intersection of lives with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, there was a precise intersection of lives with the Apostle Peter and with Dorcas, Tabitha, because God had a purpose to accomplish. Isn't it nice to know that we have a sovereign God? Not a God who is sitting in heaven, biting his fingernails and wondering what's going to happen next. He's a God who is in control of the individual lives of insignificant, humanly speaking, people. And so we see it here. No one would have guessed that particular route for Peter to get back to Jerusalem if the text left us uninformed. God gave Peter a route that Peter's enemies would not have been able to guess at either. We would not have guessed that Peter would stay there for such a long time. It tells us that it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. But you see, God was laying a foundation for another key part in church history. He was laying the foundation for another key church. He was laying the foundation for something else that we see that takes place from where God calls Peter to go next. One step at a time, from Lydda to Joppa to the house of Cornelius. Do you trust God for the daily steps of life? Not merely for the big, long-range visions and plans that you have for the future. Do you trust him now? for what he will have you to do now, where he will have you to go today, with whom he would have you to speak, to whom he would have you to minister. You know, the disciples at Joppa probably would not have sent for Peter unless this woman had had a very key role apparently insignificant in the eyes of the world, but a key ministry among the believers at Joppa. In fact, a very special group of believers, widows and orphans. She didn't have much. She didn't have apostolic gifts. She certainly was no preacher. But she used the gifts that God gave her to minister where she was and at the time God put her there. 
And God considered her important enough for that church that he sent Peter to raise her from the dead. That's one of the most awesome miracles, as you know, in the New Testament, raising someone from the dead. What a magnificent picture it gives to us of the grace of God. God was also laying a foundation in a key port from which the gospel would spread around the Mediterranean world. Now, as we mentioned a moment ago, Peter's enemies would never have guessed where he was and where he would be found after he left the city of Jerusalem. They wanted Peter because Peter was key to this new movement. He was, in their eyes, a criminal man. We learned that from Acts chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. This is political expediency that's going on. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, interesting, Peter wasn't caught until after his ministry to Aeneas and after his ministry to Tabitha, after he had planted some seeds that were going to grow into a gigantic tree and spread more seeds everywhere else, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So it would have been just about this time of the year that that was going on. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. He was a key person. And we see him having some key ministry from this point, too. But God had planned this special intersection in the life of Peter for his path. The apostle to the Jews was going to become the one who opened the door for the Gentiles. And it would be from Joppa that Peter goes from this point up to the household of Cornelius, a very key Gentile soldier. It would be an intersection that would be very difficult if Peter had gone directly back to Jerusalem. In the meanwhile, God had planned a special intersection of paths for Peter and a woman who had some of the most important service gifts in the church at Joppa. Remember this phrase. There are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. There are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. Now that brings us to Tabitha. We've talked about the city of Joppa. We've talked about the way in which the gospel spread from there. But now we come to the name Tabitha. The text also calls her Dorcas, as you can see here. Both of those names mean a female gazelle which is a beautiful and a very graceful animal. We notice that she's an active disciple, a certain disciple named Tabitha, at the end of the verse, who was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. She was an active disciple. Too many people come to church and they think they've tipped their hat to God because they showed up once a week for one hour, if they even made it for a full hour, you know, came in just before the sermon and then, you know, left at the end before the hymn is finished singing. And they think that they've done their deed for God and the rest of the week belongs to them. This is a very active disciple, this woman Dorcas, this woman Tabitha. She used her talents for Christ and to serve others. What about you? Are you using the talents that God has given you to serve Christ and to serve others. She didn't sit and sulk, she stood and served. A good contrast as we examine our own lives, are we sitting and sulking about what we wish were happening and why we didn't get our own way? Or are we standing and serving? She clearly had several of the very important spiritual ministry gifts that were needed by the church at Joppa. But first let me mention one of the gifts that is often overlooked here in this passage. Uh, it's one that, as you read through it, you focus on what she was doing. 
But we have a definition given to us in this passage that helps us to understand one of the spiritual gifts. It's not active in the passage. She's not using that spiritual gift in the passage. But there's a phrase in this passage that helps us define one of the misused and abused spiritual gifts which the charismatics try to grab hold of and run with today. Rather interesting as we read that little phrase there. Look at the phrase named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. That phrase, which by interpretation ties us to the spiritual gift of interpretation and helps us to understand its definition. This is the gift of translation. Modern charismatics often claim that the gift of interpretation enables them to determine some kind of a mystical meaning of visions, dreams, or even mystical meanings of very clear passages of scripture. The allegorical method of interpretation, quote unquote, does that. It takes very clear passages of scripture and begins to make them fuzzy and foggy. So they don't really mean what they say. People be warned, watch out for this phrase. I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. When you hear that, your antenna should go up and say, wait a minute, what is this guy trying to tell us? I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. It means, and then they go off and give some kind of a mystical, allegorical interpretation. And many who are involved in covenant theology do that. I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. Be very careful. God says what he means and means what he says. You don't have to allegorize it or spiritualize it. Yes, he does use imagery in scripture. He does use symbols in scripture. But you will discover that every place he uses a symbol, he somewhere else in scripture tells you what the symbol means. For example... Very simple. The Lamb of the Old Testament. We know what that is a symbol for. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. John says to us in John 1.29, Behold, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. If you were with us on Resurrection Sunday, you remember us speaking about the risen Lamb a lamb that was slain, but it's standing. He is the one who has the authority to take the scroll out of the hand and open the scroll and break the seals of judgment. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. When God gives you a symbol in Scripture, you don't have to make up what it is or think about some cool ways to interpret it. God always explains to us in his word what he means by the symbol, and the symbol gives to us immense amounts of information because we understand what it means. When we're dealing with the gift of interpretation, it's seen in the context of the interpretation of tongues. Think translation. Every place that interpretation shows up in the New Testament it is translation from one human language, a real human language, into another real human language. This is one of the passages that demonstrates to us what the word means and how it is used in its context. You see the name Tabitha is Aramaic. It means a female gazelle in English. The name Dorcas is Greek. It means, in translation, a female gazelle. Tabitha is the same name as Dorcas. They both mean a female gazelle. And so we see something even here in a passage which we might overlook as we are looking at what she did, which helps us define a word as we get to 1 Corinthians. But the key gifts that Tabitha had here were clearly the gifts of helps, the gift of mercy, the gift of ministration, and the gift of giving. Now folks, here is an illustration for us of what every one of us should be doing. 
because these are every believer gifts. Every one of those four gifts is an every believer gift. I think she clearly had the gift of mercy. You recall the definition when we were studying the spiritual gifts. The gift of mercy enables every believer to cheerfully provide practical relief, not mere pity, for suffering believers. What was she doing? She was busy using her hands to provide practical relief to the widows and orphans. She was a seamstress. God had talented her, had gifted her hands with the ability to make clothing. For us today here in the United States, it's almost something that we think of as, you know, man, I don't be bothered with that. I'll go down to Walmart, spend, you know, 15 bucks and get myself a pair of jeans. <laughs> I don't think any of us here in this place have ever, ever sewn a pair of jeans. You know, you look at that double stitching, you look at the fancy stitching on the back of the pockets and all that kind of stuff. I try to wait until they go down to $10. $10. You know, people making minimum wage have to work for an hour and a quarter to get $10. Could you make a pair of jeans in an hour and a quarter? Could you buy the fabric, cut the cloth, sew it together for $10? We have so much clothing that there is a little building sitting in the back of our parking lot where we in this church and others in the community trying to clean out the clutter in their houses pack up bags and bags of clothing and stick it in that little building. Dear people, it has not always been so. Certainly not around the world today and certainly not in history People who owned a piece of clothing that was in addition to what they were wearing considered themselves very blessed. Here's a lady who was doing something that was needed. Here's a lady who was expending her own resources for people who had no resources. Here was a lady who was doing something for people who were not very important. The gift of mercy enables a believer to cheerfully provide practical relief, not mere pity. Man, I really feel sorry for you, and I am sure sorry that you are cold. I'm sure sorry you're hungry. Be warmed and filled. She was providing practical relief for suffering believers. That's listed, as you know, as one of the spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. He that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. This is a lady who was a bright spot in the heart of the church. Here was a lady who had a cheerful spirit. And when she died, people cared. It was God who allowed her to get sick. God can give us perfect health if he wishes. God can allow us to go through times of sickness and suffering and even death. We find that there's an interconnection with spiritual gifts the next thing that I think we see Tabitha had here was the gift of helps. The gift of helps, you recall, as it was defined and we studied it in detail, enables every believer to strengthen weakened believers by bearing part of their workload. This was a gift, you remember, that comes alongside. It's what the gift of helps deals with, special word that's used there for coming alongside of someone who has a need. It's used of a ship that is so loaded with fish that it's beginning to sink and the other disciples came in their little boat alongside to help. It's used of the Holy Spirit who is our paraclete, the one who is called alongside to give us help. God had placed her there in that church as one who came alongside to help those who are in a weakened state 
and incapable of taking care of themselves. Do you go alongside and help those who need help? Or do you focus on yourself? Do you use your resources for others who have practical needs? Or do you use your resources only for yourself? Do you have skills and talents that others perhaps do not have and you use it to help them meet their needs? I think that Tabitha, from what we learn of her in the text, had the gift of helps. She clearly had the gift of giving. It was costing her something to be able to make these things, and she didn't say, well, look, I'm just loaning this to you. As soon as uh, the day is over and you get home and put on your pajamas, I want it back in my house overnight. She gave it to them. Clothing that she had made. The gift of giving enables every believer, not just some believers, to provide money and genuine need-based material goods to needy believers. These are need-based material goods. You know, God uses people. I've said that many times, and I know you've heard that. God uses people. God didn't miraculously provide clothing for all of those widows and orphans at Joppa. God used Dorcas. The gift of giving enables every believer to provide not just money, but need-based material goods to needy believers. She was doing it for the believers in the church. It was the disciples at Joppa who sent for Peter because of her ministry in the church. And giving not only material goods, but doing it cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. You remember we looked at all those passages related to giving, and each one of those is a key element of the way in which giving is to take place. We talked about how this is not the same thing as tithing. She was not each week figuring out, let's see, what kind of income did I get this week? And one-tenth of that will be, um, I'll go buy cloth with that. And let's see, out of 168 hours in a week, I will use 16.8 hours to make clothes. I wonder how, much of us, how many of us even tithe our time. If you think about it, there are 168 hours in a week. Do you spend 16.8 hours a week specifically serving Christ? We don't see any of that here in the text of her trying to figure out so that she didn't give too much so that she didn't meet too many believers' needs. Well, okay, there are six orphans in the church and there are five widows in the church. And you know, if I'm going to take care of widows and orphans, I guess, you know, figure out my annual income, I can take care of three of them. We're not told even that she was married. We don't know if she had a job. Maybe she was a seamstress by profession. Maybe she was married and got just a household income from her husband who worked and then gave her money, as many husbands do, to his wife. And then she took that and from what was given to her, she not only managed the entire household and bought all the food for the household and did all the things that were necessary for her own household, she took what she had and she used it for others. And look at what a miracle God did in her life. I suspect that if she had been a woman, and there were no doubt women in the church, there at Joppa who were like this, because there are women like this everywhere. If she had been a woman who merely took what she had, hoarded it for herself, put it away in a nest egg for her retirement, or whatever specials were going to go on in the local shops, perhaps she would not have died. Oh, she would have eventually died, but we would never have seen the sequence of events that take place here in this passage, whereby God, through her, had a massive explosion of the gospel that reached the ancient world when Peter raised her from the dead. We all make choices every day. We all make choices every day. 
and every one of our choices, whether they are big choices or little choices, have consequences. Maybe she got a cold. Maybe she'd gone out to minister and take something to one of the widows or orphans and got pneumonia and died from that. Maybe as she was going, she had heat stroke. We don't know what killed her. She got sick and she died. But the reason the church cared was because of what she was doing for the weakest and the smallest and the least. Oh, that we might be remembered that way because of what we have done in love for the rest of the body of Christ. She gave. The gift of giving enables every believer not only to provide money, but to provide genuine need-based material goods to the needy believers cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. That is, without folds, an ulterior motive hidden under the cloak. You recall how we looked at those various passages. Finally, the last thing that clearly she had was the gift of ministration. The gift of ministration enables every believer to humbly serve other believers. To humbly serve other believers. That's a frequently unused gift in the church, and yet that is an every believer gift. A gift whereby we humbly serve others. It's not the gift of administration, but the gift of ministration. It's the word for humble servant, like a slave. It's the same Greek word from which we get our word translated deacon. The gift of ministration implies hard work of a non-glorious type. I've seen many times my own wife sitting at the sewing machine in the middle of the night, busily repairing something that I tore. Busily putting patches on it for me. There have been many times in our lives when we've been very, very poor. And so what we had to wear was what we had. <laughs> and if it got messed up, she humbly served me by taking it, finding a piece of cloth, getting on a sewing machine that came out of a sweatshop in, in Patterson, New Jersey. It's one of these big, heavy machines with a leather belt that goes down to a big motor that's underneath it and it has a one and a half inch thick solid wood top and a, a big pedal down on the bottom of it and she'd sit there with that thing and this very very old looking kind of spotlight that shines down she still sews on this machine today it's not one of your modern fancy machines that does all the kinds of fancy stuff that these plastic machines do today it's a workhorse machine. And because she loves me, she sews. Dorcas, I think, was a woman like that. She didn't have a machine of any kind. She did it by hand. She was willing to serve other believers in a non-glorious type of work. No praise for it. The best example of service, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. It shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, Dorcas was, in the eyes of God, among the greatest of all. That's the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. That's the word for a servant, the gift of ministration. Whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. Because this reflects our Lord Jesus Christ. And so back to the title of the message. Are you a Tabitha? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the beauty of this woman a woman who lived and died and 
after she died and was raised, of course, died again. But she was busily involved in ministering to others, and you used her to be such a point of reference when Peter raised her from the dead that the gospel was spread throughout the Middle East. You had placed her. At some point in her life, perhaps she was born in Joppa, or perhaps she came there as a tiny child with her parents, or perhaps moved there with her husband, but you had her in that location at that point in history so that you could do in her life something that would spread the gospel. But meanwhile, she was busy serving your people. Father calls each one of us to recognize that no matter how insignificant we are, when we are in your hands, we can be used for the glory of Christ and for the good of those around us. Please take this message, use it to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.